we're going to talk about some slugs and some earwigs and cabbage loopers. And we're going to see if we can figure out how to keep them out of your garden or at least stop them from decimating everything. It's been so wet and so cool this spring that that's one of the major complaints. People are saying that their stuff's coming up or it's not coming up at all. They're just not seeing anything. And it's just a case of as soon as that poor little green sprout sticks its head up at night, the slugs are coming through, the earwigs are coming through, and they're just eating them right down to the ground and they don't stand a chance. Uh, as far as slugs go, there's a couple of things that you can do. You've probably heard of most of them, where you take a small tin and you fill it up with beer and you put it in the ground and the slugs will come on. They love the yeasty smell of the beer. They go in, they drown. They can't get, <laughs> they can't get out, but at least they've had a happy ending. Some other things that you can do, You've got copper tape that you can pick up. If you're really artsy fartsy, you can get yourself an embossing pen and you can make yourself really fancy little ones. And this you would just put on the edge of your bed, hammer it in. And they seem, apparently they get like little electric shocks. They just really don't like going across it and that's gonna keep the slugs out of your garden. If you've got leftover wire like this, you can try laying it down and just stapling it on and see if that helps. I'm not too sure. I'm thinking it would work. I'm just not too sure of the width of it. Some companies have, you can get this mesh and it's really nice. It's light. If you've got pots, you can slide your pot in and have the mesh coming up so you don't have to worry about the slugs coming up. It's really easy to cut. And then you can just use thumbtacks if you want and put that down as a barrier. So it's, it's easy, it's effective. Um, it just might not be what you wanna do. It might be too pricey, especially if you've got a huge garden that might not work. And in that case, I would suggest the, the old beer in the tin can or margarine tub. Um, what else can you do other than hand picking them? Oh. If you eat oranges or grapefruits in the morning, when you cut them in half, once you finish scooping everything out and indulging, go put your rinds upside down in the garden because the slugs will go and they'll hide underneath it. They're attracted to the scent, they hide underneath it. And in the morning, you can just turn it over and go, whew, all right, toss it in the garbage. Uh, what else can you do? You can use a board. You can just use any kind of wood as long as it's slightly elevated off the ground because again, they're going on the damp ground they hide underneath it in the morning, just pick it up, turf them in a, in a bucket of soapy water. You can pay your kids. Go pick slugs. If you get this many, I'll give you this much. Or if you get, <laughs> if you get this many, you can play your game for that much longer. So those are just some of the easy things that you can do. Watering in the morning, letting this lovely wind dry the top surface of your soil out helps too because slugs like the damp and that's what they're going to go for. Uh, same thing with sow bugs and pill bugs. If you want to get rid of those, the easiest method is simply just to get rid of the leaf litter and that kind of debris or dry out the surface. They are more related to a lobster than anything and they have to have the, they have to have the wet to be able to breathe. So if it's all dried out, they're going to die or they're going to go someplace else. Earwigs. Earwigs make much the same kind of damage that slugs do. My poor old lettuce, it got chewed up really bad. So I handpicked a whole bunch of them off. They like to hide in the center. Earwigs, again, don't like the light, just like the slugs. They want it nice and damp and dark. They usually come out at night and I've got one neighbor whose kids used to just be absolutely appalled with her. They were just so embarrassed because she would put on one of those miner lamps and she'd go out at night into her garden and she'd shine the light onto the plants and all the earwigs would jump off and she'd pick them up, throw them in a bucket of soapy water. But she, her kids were absolutely mortified. Mom, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can do that. You can go out into your garden in the middle of the night if you want to see if that's what's actually getting your plants. Shine a light on it. Put a piece of paper, white paper underneath, shake your plant. They'll drop off like crazy. 
You don't need to get rid of all of them either though because they do eat aphids. So if they're not totally decimating your garden, leave some of them alone. They're not all that bad. One of the other tricks I just learned, I haven't tried it, but I'm going to today and I'll let you, I'll let you know how it works. I have cats, so I'm not really certain about this. They apparently really love sardine juice with a squirt of lemon. So if you've got earwigs, you get yourself a tin can with your sardine juice in it, with your squirt of lemon, and you bury it in the ground. Fancy. <laughs> and apparently the earwigs will go to it and they will drown in it. I'm not sure this is gonna work. This is one of the reasons why. But I am gonna try it, I wanna see. I'm curious. And this isn't where it's gonna stay. It's gonna go where I actually have the earwig problem and it's gonna go underneath some of the leaves. So I should be all right with the cats. But that was that. So the only other thing I can suggest The only other thing I can suggest you can use is your, uh, your slug and snail bait. I use this as a last resort. It has to be moist. Your ground has to be wet. You put this on. It should be fine, but when it says keep away from children, I'm not so sure I want it in my garden. And the other one is your diatomaceous earth. This one is highly effective. It only works when it's dry, so after it rains, it loses its effectiveness. It is incredibly powdery. So if you're using it, try to remember to do it on a calm day or to make sure you wear a mask, okay? It's not good for any soft tissues. But you would just put that around your plants. Anything that, anything that has a soft body um, crawls across it. This diatomaceous earth just carves them up so they get desiccated. They just dry out and they die. But it is not, oh, I've lost the word. It doesn't care if you're a ladybug or you're an earthworm or you're an earwig, earwig or a slug. Whatever goes across is gonna get sliced up. So be careful when you're using it because you don't wanna get rid of your pollinators, okay? And that's about all I've got. If you can keep the surface dry, if you can try beer or you can try salmon juice or sardine juice, go for it. Use these guys as the last resort. Hey, thought I'd do a mention on cabbage loopers or those little nasty little green worms that end up in your broccoli and your cabbage and just can decimate it like crazy. The ones that go in your green kale and you find them right up the rib. Only if you look really, really carefully, sometimes you have to get your finger in there and you're going, oh, oh no, I didn't see it, but yep, there it is. Those lovely little schizoid moths, those little white cabbage butterflies or cabbage moths that you see flitting around right now. They are getting busy. They wanna do the bum butt on, the, on your brassicas, on your cabbages, and when they do that, they're dropping off little eggs. Now these guys are usually kind of a creamy white to yellow, and they're typically on the underside of the leaf um, and singly. You won't find them all clustered together. There'll be one over here, there'll be one over there. Easiest way to get rid of those little green worms, get rid of those eggs. Just wipe them off, you're done. You've solved the problem before it even started. Just make sure that they are single though because ladybug eggs look really similar. They are long, they are yellow, but they're usually in a little group of like 10 or 12. So if you see them grouped like that, err on the side of caution, see what happens. Um, if you do have them, you can, and I'm talking about the moths, there are two different kinds. There's the ones that you get from the little white, the little white cabbage moth that flips around, but there's also a nocturnal brown moth who does the same thing, and those are what you get the loopers from. They're a little bit skinnier, and they inch along just like those storybook caterpillars. If you have a large garden, you can use something like this. This is a bug screen. Just make sure that you've got it secured down at the bottom over some hoops so that it's not really touching your plants. All the moisture, all the sun's gonna get going through here. Um, if you're trying to do it and you're covering your squash, just remember that you're gonna have to roll it back at some point because not only does it keep those pests out, but it's gonna keep your pollinators out too. 
And if you do that over your squash, you're going to have to get in there and hand pollinate everything. Uh, what else can I tell you? You can use that, um, it's a bacterial product called BT, and you can use that. It's most effective if you follow the instructions on the bottle, number one, but it's most effective if you use it in the evening. Um, and it, it degrades in the sunshine, and it's usually most potent after two to three days, and then it starts losing its appeal, and it, by the end of a week, it's just not going to work anymore. It also works best when the little caterpillars are less than an inch long, okay? If they're bigger, it's not really effective. And it just stops them from eating. It's not harmful to people. It's not harmful to pets. Um, you can actually apply it the same day that you're going to harvest your stuff if you wanted to. But hand picking, I find, is the way to go. If you are active in your garden, once or twice a week, just look underneath those cabbage leaves and your brassica and see if they're there. Check your kale. And, oh, and one trick that I've learned is if you want, plant those blue and purple cabbages and the red ones because apparently they don't attack them as much. And they're not sure whether it's because the worms find it easier to hide on the plain green veggies, or if it's because those other plants are so full of a certain flavonoid that is actually slightly toxic to them, so they stay away from it. So I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll, I'll eat green cabbages if I have to, but I'm gonna lean towards the purple ones and whatever the blue one looks like, I'm gonna check it out. <laughs> but that's it for the loopers. If you can get ahead, get the eggs. Use your screen if you have to, if you've got a really big garden. Um, or the BT if you see it and they're already in there and you just don't wanna pick them because they're really kind of gross and goosey. Okay, right now I'm sitting in front of my beans and they are really, really anemic looking, you guys. Um, they're just flat out sad. They need some more nitrogen. So what I'm doing is I have taken a pot and I have a whole bunch of worm castings and I have mixed it up with my 444 fertilizer. And this for me just, it means I'm not gonna have big clumps of it hanging around anywhere and I love adding the worm castings to my garden anyway. And so side dressing simply means you're going beside your plants and you're just gonna add in your fertilizer and it'll all get watered in. Because the roots are, they're not going straight down, they're going all over the place. So it makes it nice and easy. And hopefully, by next week, they will be lovely and green. They did the same thing to me last year. I did this and it just worked out really, really well. And I had a really good crop. And that's what you can do. I don't know, I know you can see my potatoes. We were actually gonna show you how to grow them, but with the weather, we kept getting rained out. So I'm sorry, I started these guys way down. I dug right down to the bottom of my bed and I put the potatoes in. I put about two inches of soil over top and I have just been slowly hilling them up until it got to as tall as I wanted. And now I'm just letting them grow. Eventually they're gonna get flowers on them and about 10 days after they've flowered, you can, if you're really curious, stick your fingers down in the soil, go down a couple of inches, and you should find some marble-sized potatoes. Then you know it's working, they're growing. Once all the uh, foliage starts looking like it's getting ready to die, it's gonna start turning yellow and looking a little on the sad side. You can dig your potatoes up then. If you're gonna eat them right away, feel free. Pull up the plant, take all the potatoes off, take them into the house, wash them up, and enjoy them. If you want to keep them for storage for a little bit longer, then you are going to chop off all this green right to the ground, and then you're going to leave them in there for about a week or two, okay? The longer you leave them in, the tougher the skins get, and it just makes them store better. And that is about that. I'm going to get off my knees, and I'm going to go look at my garlic. Here's my garlic, and it's growing up pretty good. I haven't had to water it at all this year, thank you. But right now I've just got the scapes starting, if you can see it. This is gonna, if you leave it, it's going to curl. And we suggest that you 
cut them off. You know what? I have a pair of scissors. I'm going to show you. You go in and you just cut it off. Just like that. And you have this lovely scape. These things taste fantastic. You can go down to the farmer's markets. They're going to have these by the fistful pretty soon. They are so good in salads. They're really good sauteed. Some people pickle them. Feel free to enjoy them. But the biggest reason that you are doing this is because if you don't, this scape is going to turn into a flower. It's going to get about that big. And then eventually it's going to go to seed, which is wonderful if you want to save all the little bulbs or seeds on the top out of that flower for growing your own. Um, but when you cut these off, all the energy that this plant is getting is now going in and it's going to make your garlic bulb even bigger. Okay. I've got lots and lots of big garlic here and I have some little teeny tiny ones that are starting at the bottom. I told you one year just to put them in a pot so that you wouldn't lose them. And this year I thought, I'm not going to lose them in with these guys. So I planted them in between all my big cloves. And so far so good. They're only going to be little tiny things this year. And next year I'll replant them and they'll get a little bit bigger. I'm finding sometimes it's the third year that I plant them that I actually get the really big, the big cloves of garlic. And it's lovely. And that's probably it for my garlic talk. This, they're going to be ready to pull sometime in July. So we're getting there, you guys. And it's going to be awesome. Jo yeah, I was just going to say, you'll know your garlic is ready to harvest when the bottom leaves. Probably about the bottom four leaves will start to die. They'll get all yellow and brown. And then you're going to know it's time that you can lift them out of the garden. When you do that, just make sure you air dry them. Keep them someplace where there's good airflow, whether it's in the house or on a screen outside or hanging them upside down someplace and let them dry out until the stalk's completely dry. And then you're going to cut them off about that far, maybe two inches above the bulb. And that stops your garlic from drying out and it just stores longer and better for you. And I think that's all I've got to say on garlic today. Hey kids. Here's a book for you. It's called Planting the Wild Garden. And this is a book about how seeds travel. It's really interesting. It's by Catherine O. Galbraith, which I think is kind of a cool name. But it's going to talk to you about how seeds travel, whether it is burrs when you're walking through a field and you get all those little things that stick to your socks and to your pants, whether they travel by wind, whether they travel by birds, because birds eat them, they poop them out, away they go. But it's a really interesting book. It's an easy read. It's got some wonderful pictures in it. And you'll learn stuff and not even mind learning. And it's absolutely brilliant. So see if you can find it at the library or at the bookstore, then you can keep it. And one other thing I wanted to tell you about was this is a group They've got a bunch of CDs. It's called the Banana Slug String Band. I think they are down in the States in California, but don't quote me on that. I just know that they have some absolutely wonderful songs like Dirt Made My Lunch or FBI, that's fungus, bacteria, invertebrates. They have things about sun, soil, and water. This one's got roots, stems, and leaves. They're just, they're fun songs, they're educational songs, um, and you can find a lot of them on YouTube if you want to check them out, see what you think of them, see what kind of songs you can learn. I really like the FBI one is my absolute favorite, and followed by Dirt Made My Lunch. Hey, it's Candice with Fro Local, and right now we're going to talk about some pots. Different pots for different things, different situations, but it's kind of nice to know what kind of pots you want to use for what you're going to be growing. These are your terracotta pots. They come in a whole lot of different sizes, different styles. Some of them are really pretty and intricate. Some are just really plain Jane. Um, they're really good when you are growing things that don't like to stay wet because terracotta is clay and it is really, really porous. Downside of these is that if we have re a lot of wet weather and cold weather, which we do, 
you get that expansion contraction and they do have a tendency to break. But if it's in a sheltered spot, these things can last you for years. And if you look around, some pot companies have actually started adding certain chemicals to make their terracotta pots more frost proof, um, which is kind of exciting. They are a little bit on the heavier side, but like I said, they are really good for growing things like your rosemary and your oregano, cactus and succulents. Because sometimes you want to have kind of an edible looking garden. These ones are going to be your ceramic. So they're still fairly porous, but they usually have a finish on the outside that holds more of the moisture in. So they have less of a tendency to crack. But again, when you're purchasing them, they will usually say they're frost resistant, not frost proof. So they will last you for several years. Um, if you know that we're going to have a whole lot of rain followed by a cold spell or cold snap, Try to keep your heavier pots on caddies because you should actually move them into a sheltered spot closer to the house or something. Otherwise, you're going to find that expansion and contraction and your pots will crack. But again, you should get years out of these things. Next up, plastic pots. Really good for things that need to retain moisture. Um, they're a lot lighter. So if you're growing on a deck or a balcony and weight's going to be an issue, these are really good. You can find plastic pots now um, that actually come with a guarantee that they're not going to get brittle and they're not going to sun fade for up to 10 years, which is really kind of nice. Um, and like I said, they are so good for so many things and they come in so many different colors and styles. These are a really a go-to one. Um, other ones you can get are made out of fiberglass. I don't have those today. Um, but again, they'll last you probably longer than the plastic pots will. And again, they come in a whole bunch of different sizes. The prices on your plastic pots, ceramic pots, and your fiberglass ones are anywhere from inexpensive to, <laughs> are you kidding? So bear that in mind when you go shopping. Other things you can use are your hanging baskets. This is a coir insert. And you can get these in window boxes and huge, huge ones and really small ones. These guys, this is what they look like when they're new. This is what mine looks like after, after about three years. Still got mud on the bottom. Um, the only time I have really had them get really ratty is when the birds discovered them and wanted to use it for nesting material. And thanks, I'll share. I have no problem with that. And for some of your other hanging baskets, um, good old moss. If you've got a fairly tight weave on the basket and you've got access to moss, green side out, brown side on the inside, um, make it a good big fat layer. It really acts as an insulator, keeps the soil in, keeps the moisture in. This one is a felt and they come in different sizes again. And this one's a little bit too small for this hanging basket, but you'll get the idea. You just pop it in and put your soil in. Again, it holds the moisture beautifully, doesn't allow the soil to all dribble out, and the plants really like it. So there's a couple of different options for you, a couple of different ideas. If you are really on a budget and you've got the frames, but you don't, ha you don't have the money to go out and buy the liners, if you've got old fabric, you can use burlap, you can use flower sacks, you can use old sheets or your kid's old flannel shirt. It doesn't really matter because all you need is something that's going to not fall apart, hold the soil in, and especially with hanging baskets, your plants are probably going to be cascading over the sides and nobody's going to know what's in there either. So, use what you've got, make the most of it, and have fun growing.